Welcome to this fourth week of Advent. We just made our way up through this desert. This is the Judean desert, which butts up against Jerusalem. And so I invite you to sit down around your Advent wreath, light that fourth candle as we begin our reflections on this nativity trail. It's been such a beautiful path through the desert, and I wanna just point out where we've been. You can see these two hills in the distance if you follow the road, the modern road behind me. It goes between those two hills, and that was originally called the Red Road. Red because the stones there are red, but red also because it's where many assassins would hide, killers would hide, thieves would hide. And so people that were coming up from Jericho to Jerusalem, like Mary and Joseph did during that first Christmas, would have been in danger of being, um, you know, uh, their, their things being stolen, they would be assaulted. But we talked about that last time, but this is the road that they would have taken from that area up here to Jerusalem. And you notice it is up. Jerusalem is always up because it's on a hill. In this beautiful December day, it's actually not too cold, but you have a chilly wind because you know the rains have begun and, and, and Christmas is coming. But there is a pathway that is tiring. And you can imagine how tired Mary would have been at this point. But at the same time, in the same spirit as that third week of Advent, they would be filled with joy because they're going to see what the Psalm says uh, I rejoice because they saith unto me, I come unto the house of the Lord. We're going into the gates of Jerusalem. And so this joy, this rejoicing from the third week is going to be uh, even closer to being fulfilled with the birth of Christ, but they'll see the temple which fills all the pilgrims that come up to Jerusalem with joy. So let's see what they see as soon as we cross over this top of the Mount of Olives. Follow me. So we've just come over the crest of this hill, the Mount of Olives, and you can see below me an entire olive grove. <clears throat> if you come here to Jerusalem, you can actually take this pathway and you can walk through this beautiful nature here toward Jerusalem to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. It's just incredible. But what you notice as you cross over from the desert, immediately your sight is filled with the holy city of Jerusalem. Even today, you can see the pathway along this um, side of the Mount of Olives that Mary and Joseph may have taken, and they see the temple just like they would have seen uh, 2,000 years ago, all the people that came to this area. Now, this part of the Mount of Olives was referred to as the Galilee, and that's because the people, just like Mary and Joseph, who came from the north, would have made you know, the trek over that crest, just like we did with all of you in our Nativity Trail, and they would have camped out right here in these great pilgrimage feasts when they would have to go up to the temple three times a year. And so just to make a, a reference, <clears throat> the ascension is right to my right. And that's because Jesus said after he, he died and he said, uh, you know, meet me in Galilee, it's very likely he meant this place because we have the place of the ascension where all the people came together around him uh, at the time in his life. So it would have been right here. Now, as I had mentioned, they were filled with joy as they're coming here to see Jerusalem, as the Psalm said. And I want to focus a little bit on what Joseph may have had inside of his heart at this time. You read in the liturgy that he um, trusted in the Lord. He took Mary as his wife, even though uh, she was found with child and he knew it wasn't his child, but he trusted in the Lord. He had great faith in the Lord. He believed that he was loved by the Lord. So you can imagine his relief as he comes down here and finally sees Jerusalem, knows that Bethlehem is very close, very, very close to Christmas. And it's almost as if the Lord is confirming him in his faith and saying, you see, I fulfill my promises. This is the great city of the promise, the great city of the chosen people. The Lord saves his people through the Jews, through the chosen people. Salvation comes through the Jews. That's something that we know. But there's something new that's happening and stirring in the womb of the Virgin Mary even more strongly at this point. I'm sure she can feel the baby kicking. And that is, it's not just the Jewish people that are the chosen ones. It is the entire uh, population of the world. It's every human being from the beginning of time until the end of time, which is called, who are called and chosen by God. This is what the Lord came to reveal with his incarnation and his birth. 
And so this is the joy that we're all feeling at this point in Advent. And I want to read something. It's from a French book on the Psalms and it speaks about faith. And I think it summarizes a little bit about what Joseph may have been feeling in Mary herself as they see the Temple Mount down there that you can make out, of course, the Dome of the Rock, but also the walls of old, the old city of Jerusalem and the walls of the old Temple Mount that they would have seen. This is what it says. Faith is the shuddering certainty of love. Shuddering certainty of love. You know, you just shake. Yes, faith is certain of love, but not a certainty that can be taken for granted. Faith is literally awe-filled. Like the first time you come here and you're like, oh, I didn't expect to see this view. It's so profound that it pushes us to the edge of disbelief. We tremble because of our unworthiness, emotion, and wonder. We struggle with a measure of resistance as well. This cannot be right. It doesn't apply to me. It doesn't agree with my life history. Maybe Mary was thinking that this little girl from this village in the middle of nowhere, or Joseph, why am I caught up in this incredible plan of salvation? How can I be uh, the focus of God's great love? Well, this resistance brings us to that. It doesn't agree with my life history. It seems too stunning to be true. I am utterly beloved of God, beloved by God. Oh God, we could say, we could pray. Help me to believe the truth about myself no matter how beautiful it is. And when the Jewish people came and gazed upon the Temple Mount, and even people today when they come and see the beauty of the city of Jerusalem, and even the Holy Sepulchre that you can make out there on the horizon, it's like this is so beautiful, and it's a reflection of the beauty in me, and the beauty that God sees in me and brings out from me. So this love accepted and taken seriously turns our lives around. Faith changes us completely. Believing in this awesome love that God has for me, I stand amazed and immensely grateful. How can this be? Is it really true? Am I so loved? These are questions for this fourth Sunday of Advent. Now let me just take you down the pathway that Mary and Joseph would have taken from here you can see a path beside me, like I said, they'd walk on the ridge of the Mount of Olives and then they would have to cross over the Kidron Valley, perhaps on that very bridge that Jesus crossed on the night of Holy Thursday when he went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. But then they would make their way along the side of the temple, those walls that you can see in the distance. They would cross to the right, which would be toward the west, probably um, through the city of David at that time because they were looking for a road called Hebron. That's a road that's been there since the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the patriarchs took that road and that road would take them to the south, called straight south toward Hebron. Now they would take the Hebron road out of Jerusalem and then take a little left turn eventually to the little tiny city or the little tiny town of Bethlehem. Now I just want to mention again what Mary would have been feeling. You know, we talked about Joseph, but what about Mary? Well, I think as she's getting closer, it's not only the awe and wonder of being loved and being part of the chosen people, bringing the salvation to all mankind through the woman, through the, the baby in her womb, but Jesus jumping for joy and everything. You know, women, when they're gonna give birth, feel the baby kicking. And so there's this church, which is right on the outskirts of Jerusalem, just as you take that left-hand road to go down to Bethlehem. And that church is called Our Lady of the Seat, which is very interesting. And you might be thinking, well, that's kind of a weird thing, but it has to do with the tradition that when Mary and Joseph, having come to Jerusalem, knowing that Bethlehem was so close, kind of picked up the pace. But at one point she had to stop and have a seat. She had to sit down. And so the first Christian said, this is the place right where the road turns left, where she sat down right on this rock. And so as soon as they started building Christian churches after the Edict of Milan in the fourth century, just a few years after that, they built a church around that rock. And you can see the ruins of that church today. So you can kind of imagine her with the baby jumping, both with rejoicing, but also knowing that very soon she'd have to give birth. It's almost as if there's two people fighting inside of her womb. Maybe like the people in this land and all over the world that are in, you know, a state of conflict. We always pray for peace during Christmas time because the Prince of Peace is coming. 
But it also might be that it's the two people, the pagan people, those who don't know the Lord, not the chosen people, right? But they're in conflict with the people who uh, the Lord has revealed himself to. These people who are going to be saved with the birth of Jesus himself in Bethlehem. So there she is on this rock, ready to go into Bethlehem. The church was built by a widow, actually, um, who probably understood very well what Mary may have been going through. And it was her last push to get toward Bethlehem. So just to end up, I just want to read also a quote that summarizes a bit what we've been talking about during this fourth Sunday of Advent. And that is love and the measure of God's love. Again, it's not just the chosen people in general, it's each and every one of us that has been saved by God. And so this is a man named Peter Crowner, and he says this, God takes the measure of his love not on us, but on himself. That's another way to say that God's love is wholly other. I'm just gonna stop here for a second. When we love somebody, you know, it's because we have the capacity to love them and there's something in them that makes us love them. So in a certain sense, uh, they're deserving of our love, right? So that's why we love some people more than others. God is not like that. God, who's in the womb of Mary, is actually not like that at all. He's bringing us to a different type of love. And this is what he says. We measure our love by the other person. That is why we love one person more than an and another less. It all depends on the personality of the other and the limits of my affection. God, however, does not measure love by any standard. God's love has no limits. Would someone say God begins here and ends there? God's love, God loves because God is love. In other words, we love or we do love, but God is love. And he makes every single person the subject and object rather of his love. And that's the whole meaning of Christmas, bringing us all together as the saved people. So I'm going to keep walking down this path and you're certainly welcome to join me as we continue these last steps of our nativity trail, making our way to Bethlehem. So thank you for joining us here again this fourth Sunday of Advent and know that from the Holy Land, from this beautiful, holy city of Jerusalem, we are praying for you and all of your family as we prepare ourselves for Christmas. And God bless you.